Right then, proper greeting. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Okay. This morning is kind of an interesting challenge because I'm going to be talking about community. And community, I could give you a lecture on it, I could give you a talk on it, and that's what I'm going to do my best to do this morning and keep you engaged. But community is best experienced not in a lecture format, but just relating to each other. So here's a warning. You don't have to do this. This is an invitation. But a couple of times during this talk, I'm going to ask you to turn to the person next to you and just talk a little bit. Okay, everyone take a deep breath. We'll be over soon. And maybe I'll never have to come back again. I hope that's not the case, but I understand, okay? It's a little bit awkward. And there is a nice thing about coming into a place and kind of being anonymous and invisible, and I, I, I understand that. I totally understand that. Sometimes you're in a store and you just want to browse. You just want to look around. And you get pounced on. I told you the story of my father-in-law about what he did one time. There's this very exclusive men's store. They were known for these voracious, predatory salesmen. And they would just latch on to you. And my grand, my, sorry, my father-in-law had this perfectly figured out and looking at suits. And he turned to the young fellow and says, how do you think this would look in a casket? <sighs> Immediately backs off. And he's not bothered the rest of the morning. So that's a little shopping tip for you in case. Keep that in mind. Um, anyway, sometimes it's nice to just come in and browse and be quiet, but there's so much isolation in our society. We have all these imaginary digital friends that are people we barely know and probably would, might not even associate with physically if we really knew who they were. So all this increasing connectivity but also isolation in our society is a huge problem. And what God designed the church for is to be a community. A couple of weeks ago, we looked at the definition of the church from the Bible, not Webster's Dictionary. Do you remember? Uh, here's a little quiz, a little pop review quiz from two weeks ago. According to the New Testament, is the church a building? No. 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 According to the New Testament, is the church, is church a worship service? No. I'll, I'll, I'll help you with that one. According to the New Testament, is the church a religious institution? No. The church is what? The church is us. People. Literally, ecclesia. People who are called up. People who have been called up from society to, and invited into God's family. And chosen and adopted and wooed and loved and cared for. Just like these little critter, I mean babies that we saw on the platform this morning. They're, they're so cute, especially when they're sleeping. They're just adorable, right? So that's what the church truly is. And when the church got started in Acts chapter 2, we'll be looking at that passage again. It was amazing. It was amazing what God did. Here's what happened in Acts chapter 2. All these people have been gathered, they've been on a religious pilgrimage from all over the known world and found themselves in Jerusalem worshiping God. And there were people from so many different ethnicities. They had a common language, what we call Koine Greek, sort of like street Greek, which the, the New Testament was written in. Um, so they could kind of understand each other, but they're all operating maybe a second or a third language. Everybody had a heart language that they'd grown up with. We don't have time today, but I, I really want to sometime figure out how many heart languages are represented in this congregation. I think it would be really cool. Um, so that's what was going on in all these people worshiping and seeking God. They loved God and were devoted to God because they had come a long way at great expense and inconvenience to, to worship Him and connect with Him. And all of a sudden, after a long prayer meeting, 120 disciples of Jesus are praying together in this room, and boom, the Holy Spirit comes. And God shows up. 
He reveals himself in such a powerful way. All these people are praising God in all these diverse languages. And all these religious pilgrims hear the commotion and wonder what's going on. And they realize, they hear for the first time the good news about Jesus Christ. And the Bible says they're cut to the heart. How do we respond to this news that God is one of us? That he's come to reveal himself to us as a human being. What, what do we do? How do we respond? And Peter, the impromptu preacher of the day, says, all right, here's how to get your spiritual life together. You repent. That means you, you make a decision to turn the direction of your life and you get baptized and publicly identify yourself as asking God to, to wipe out all the, the junk you've ever done in your life and follow him and you're on your way. So 3,000 people did. It was an explosion. And what did they do after that? This is what they did. They devoted themselves. They, they steadily, intentionally chose to devote themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe. The many signs, the wonders and signs performed by the apostles. And every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes, house churches, and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So last week we talked about devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching. We learned that following Jesus is more caught than taught, right? It's more following the example of someone and learning by doing than just getting something out of a book. Although book learning is helpful, learning by doing is probably the best instruction you can find. So they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. Now fellowship, if you've grown up in the church, fellowship is one of those words that's a little bit amorphous, and a little bit fuzzy, and may have lost its meaning a little bit. In the church I grew up in, we had a fellowship hall, just kind of a dusty room with uncomfortable stacking chairs where the coffee wasn't great, but it was kind of warm. And the people were kind, but we generally kept it kind of about sports teams and you know, kind of surfacey. Sometimes you get into deeper discussions, but that was kind of, fellowship was a little bit awkward. It's just kind of a nebulous term. And um, for many of us, maybe that word fellowship, let's have fellowship, or someone becomes a church member and you ex extend the right hand of fellowship. I don't know what the left hand is supposed to do, but anyway, this, all these formulaic sayings, and it's become a bit of a cliche. So. Let's unpack this word fellowship a little bit more. It's got more content to it. If you're a Lord of the Rings fan, you know the Fellowship of the Ring. There's a band of people that come together. I've seen some smiles, and I appreciate that affirmation from over here. Um, a band of people get together for a common purpose, right? And they're sharing an adventures together. I, my family moved here 15 years ago so I could become part of InterVarsity Christian Fellowship, a group of people that were committed to uh, discipling young people and raising the next generation of Christian leaders. So they're it, it's still used today, but the, the Greek word that was uh, used in the New Testament for fellowship is a word called koinonia. Okay, someone taught me a really good way of remembering this word. Okay, it's a little bit corny, but what else can you expect from me? Coin. Me. Ah! Okay. Koinonia. Okay, let's try it. One, two, three. Koinonia. One more time. Koinonia. Okay, you're on, the, you're on the verge of being Greek. Awesome. Koinonia. What does koinonia mean, really? These people were devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, modeling by doing, and koinonia. Koinonia, the original meaning, had a sense of sharing together. So we're kind of shareholders of this thing called, this beautiful news called the gospel. We're in this together. Uh, on the farm I grew up on, my dad um, would take off 
the, our hay crop in shares with the neighbor. Our neighbor had the equipment and the time and my dad had the hay growing in the field, so it would be a 50-50 split. 50% of the hay would go in our neighbor's barn, 50% would go in our barn. And my neighbor got my free labor. I'm not sure what I got out of that, not to mention that. But anyway, I got a good 10. But we would do it in shares. That's an example of koinonia, sharing something. Sharing effort, investing in something, and you benefit from the results. So, when we think of sharing together, when we think of the folks in the first church, what kind of things did they share together in? They shared a common experience. They met Jesus. They encountered Jesus. And were so radically changed. All these pilgrims from all over the Mediterranean, after experiencing Jesus for uh, an extended period of time, then they went back to their homes and they, Jesus started transforming the world through them. I just imagine one of those early pilgrims going back and, and chatting up with the neighbors. So, hey, how was the trip to Jerusalem this year? You know, what'd you see? What'd you do? Oh, Shmuel, you would never understand what I meant. I met Jesus of Nazareth who completely changed my life. Let me tell you about it. And that happened all over the Mediterranean as people were sharing their experience, their knowledge of Jesus, right? They just couldn't help it. I read this morning, a, a great, uh, today, a great quote about meeting Jesus. Uh, there's this old missionary to India. He says, meeting Jesus is like swallowing sunshine. Isn't that a great picture? It's like swallowing sunshine. And Jesus changed you from the inside out and you can't help but just glow all over the place. And that's what it was like. All these folks spread out around the Mediterranean world and they're just swallowed sunshine and they're just glowing. And they're sharing. That, that koinonia gets extended. There's something about bumping into a Christian unexpectedly. You know, there's just something kind of different about that person. Maybe it's a clerk serving you in a store or someone, uh, a random uh, encounter on, on the bus or in the airport or something. You know, I thought there was something different about that person. I knew it. And what it is, it's the Spirit of Jesus in you recognizing the Spirit of Jesus in the other person. And it's fellowship. Not just chatting about the Blue Jays or the Blue Bombers or the Jets or having that, you know, sports fans have a lot in connection, right? But it's much deeper than that. It's that, it's, it's that spiritual connection that Jesus makes possible in us. So that's kind of a, one of the aspects of Koinonia. It's the shared fellowship, the this, this shared common experience that we have with Jesus. Another um, th aspect of koinonia, as we think about it, is that we have a, a common experience, but we've got shared values as well. When we start following Jesus, our world gets beautifully turned upside down, and we stop looking at people and judging them by their exteriors, and God gives us the ability and, and teaches us to start respecting people as made in the image of God. So racism and sexism and judging people about what they have or what they don't have, all those things start to fade away and we start to see people the way God sees them. We start to pe see people as the way God sees us, right? Not burdened down with failures in the past or past mistakes or whatever, but He sees us for the potential that we have. And he places value on us. And that's how we start. So we have these shared values. And fellowship can happen a lot of different ways in interesting venues. This is the third day in a row I've been in this place. So it's been an interesting weekend. On Friday night, I experienced fellowship. I experienced koinonia here on Friday night. As Pastor Tim Fletcher was shooting a video in this space talking about boundaries, and he's talking to people at Finding Freedom. Many of those folks are in recovery and trying to put their lives back together, and it was really good teaching. By the way, that's a plug. Next Friday night at 7, 
if you want to learn about boundaries, it's excellent teaching. And I told him sometimes, I wish everybody could show up on Friday. So, open invitation. So that was one area, one place where I uh, experienced quite a meal. Last night, Elvis was in the building, <laughs> along with Neil Diamond. And there was a fundraiser for Jerry Flett's daughter, Janelle, uh, trying to help raise money for her to get a service dog, to pay for a service dog named Macy, who's helping her with her uh, PTSD that she's trying to overcome. It's amazing the results that dog is generating in Janelle's life. Really good news. And there was koinonia community last night as people were bonding together, banding together to raise money in common cause to do something positive for someone in the community. It's another example. A third example, let's see, it was Friday, it was Saturday. What's next? It's Friday, Saturday, what's next? Sunday. Oh yeah, here, right. This is Koinonia. This is Koinonia, folks. I'm hoping that we're going to experience some Koinonia today. Not just a sing-along and a lecture. I mean, church is much more than that. When we gather together, it's much more than that. But it's God helping us to connect with each other. Now, here's the part of the experiment. We might start feeling just a little bit uncomfortable, but that's all right, don't worry. I'd like you to turn to someone that you may not know, okay? And uh, just ask their name. Now, I realize that we've got a challenge here because our furniture sometimes gets in the way of our human interaction, but don't worry about that. The pews are not going into Kijiji anytime soon, okay? We'll probably, they'll probably be here next week, so don't panic. But, um, though we do have an elders meeting, um, but I encourage you to meet someone. I'll give you a minute. Just to turn to somebody and say, what? Hi, what's your name? Okay, on your mark, get set, go. <laughs> We're going to do something called the Quaker Questions. The Quakers were uh, well known for gathering in small groups and asking each other just, just good questions. Like, what is your name? Where was the source of warmth in your home? And when I say that question, people say, I mean, the furnace, the fireplace, what do you mean? Well, it might be that, but where, where was the sense of, where was the place of warmth or connection in your home where you grew up? Now that's a little bit deeper question than what is your name, right? Because maybe some of us grew up in a home that was cold everywhere. Or maybe some of us grew up in a home where there was some warmth. Maybe around the kitchen table or whatever. But just, that would be the next question. The third question I'm going to get you to practice after we're done, I think. Because you guys have done so much. And I, that's how we'll dismiss, okay? Because you guys have done so well. The third question, so it's, what is your name? Uh, where was the source of warmth in your home? And the third question is, when did God become more than a word to you? Okay? When did God become more than a word to you? That's a little bit different than when we washed in the blood, brother, and when did you invite Jesus into your life? Those are okay questions, but they're a little bit wrapped in religious verbiage, but 
A simple question, when did God become more than a word to you, means that maybe you're just starting to get interested in God, and that's good. Or maybe you've been following Jesus for 30 or 40 or 50 years. That's great too. You still want God to be more than a word to you, okay? So at the end of the service, when we're done, I'm just going to turn you loose. Because you were so good at asking each other's names, I thought I'd never get you to sit down again. So, beautiful. Just a few more things about uh, community before um, I turn you loose on each other. In a good way. <laughs> In a good way. We see that community comes from shared experience and shared values and shared vision as well. Each of the groups that met Friday, Saturday, and today in this place had a particular vision of where they wanted to go. Finding freedom. Tim's vision is to teach people about healthy boundaries so they can live well and live meaningful and godly and whole lives. And last night, our vision was to raise money to help a young woman cope with the effects of PTSD. And today, What's our vision? Why are we here? I'm here to praise God. Yeah, to praise God. To praise yeah. God and and to to let others know that that is what He expects of us, and we, we need to praise Him and let Him become part of our lives. So that as we live, they, they, we don't need to talk. They will see what we believe in. Okay, that's beautiful. That, I'm just gonna repeat that and just because we just about finished the sermon right there. We, we want to praise God so that he becomes part of our lives and people will just be able to see the power and the reality of God in us. Maybe without talking, maybe with talking. It depends, right, on the situation. But that's, that's, that's beautiful. That's why we're gathering together. That's our vision, to meet and experience Jesus and to be Jesus for each other. That's what these people did. It was amazing that the community that they built, just doing life together and looking after each other. So this community uh, looked like these people were sharing with each other. No one lacked for anything. Everyone was provided for. Um, and people went above and beyond in just sharing their resources so that no one was short. <coughs> community sounds great in theory, but it's really challenging, really challenging to build. Because you might be able to find someone else's name and hear a little bit about where the source of warmth was in their home. And maybe even when God became more than just a word to them. But to take it further, what if that person is different from you? What if you find out what happens if you're in a house church and someone irritates you? What do you do? Now that would never happen here at Elon Chapel because we have no irritating people except for the pastor. But what happens if someone irritates you? Or, or what happens if you look at someone across the room and you think they're giving you the hairy eyeball? It definitely feels that way. Now you don't know what kind of day they've had. You don't know what kind of indigestion they may be suffering from. You don't know what's going on. But absolutely, it's probably about you, right? Because what else could it be? So you see how these things build up in community? And if we're going to do community and health, have healthy community, we're going to have to do something called deepening community through conflict. I hate that word conflict. I want to hide under that table or maybe a larger space and not even think about it. But that's just my personality. Probably no one else here feels that way. The good thing about conflict is that it does surface stuff that's under the surface and needs to be brought up, right? But the way we resolve conflict is so important, so important. And when we have stuff, we need to surface it directly, okay, and in a kind way. 
Fellowship, or koinonia, is based on confidence. Secret criticism breaks that confidence. We will therefore renounce all secret criticism. See what can happen in something like a, a house church, or just a, a friendship between people who are trying to build community and trying to follow Jesus together? Fellowship, koinonia, is based on confidence, right? We need to be able to trust each other. When I turn you loose, and you start answering those Quaker questions with each other. I'm looking forward to that. I just love you guys to bits for being so eager to do that. You'll be building confidence with each other, which is brilliant. That's what the Holy Spirit does. But what happens after you get to know somebody for a while? There is a temptation to come in with secret criticism. Just <laughs> Maybe you don't like... I don't know, whatever it is about them. Or we just naturally tend to rub each other the wrong way or we're different. And when that secret criticism, criticism wants to come in, it destroys that confidence. Therefore, in the name of Jesus, let us renounce all secret criticism. Do you know where I first saw this quote? It was posted in a public high school in Ontario in every classroom beside the clock. Do you know why it was posted beside the clock? Because the clock in any classroom is the most popular place to look at in the classroom, right? So the man who did this, the principal of that high school, my father-in-law Bob, he was shrewd. He was godly and shrewd. He knew that everyone would be looking at the clock. And that's why he said, fellowship is based on confidence. Secret criticism breaks that confidence. There, we will therefore renounce all secret criticism. And God used my father-in-law Bob to be a godly leader in that public high school to build community and to protect the community and morale of that school. If you want to protect the morale and community of the group that you work with or are a part of, you will renounce all secret criticism, okay? And don't give in to that temptation. That's just an example of how we build community and do life together. It's, it's challenging, it's not easy, but these common, this common experience and common values will lead to a common vision and we'll be doing life together. What happens when we want to deal with the issues? How we deal with conflict is so important. Let me leave you with a verse to ponder. The Apostle Paul is talking in the book of Ephesians about growing up. Many of our problems, our relational problems, is because we've been grown up emotionally and grown up spiritually. So this is the context he's talking about. No prolonged infancies among us, please. We will not tolerate babes in the woods, small children who are an easy mark for imposters. God wants us to grow up, to know the whole truth and to tell it in love, like Christ in everything. We take our lead from Christ, who is the source of everything we do. He keeps us in step with each other. His very breath and blood flow through us, nourishing us so that we will grow up healthy in God, robust in love. So please, no prolonged infancies. We're to grow up spiritually. One of the ways we grow up is to know the whole truth and to tell it in love. When we confront somebody, when we try to figure that out, we say, I, you know, I've been wondering. Not like I've been wondering about you, but I'm wondering, you know, I've just noticed that when we talk like this, you tend to blah, blah, fill in the blank. Can you help me understand? If we follow what's called the prayer of St. Francis, if we seek to understand more than to be understood ourselves, that goes a long way to resolving conflict in community. And you know what you'll find? I can practically guarantee this, okay? In fact, I would bet my next Tim Hortons coffee on this. That's how valuable it is. That if you do conflict well with someone, I can pretty much guarantee you will win a friend, win a deeper friendship than create an enemy if you do it well. 
pretty good promise, eh? So you take me up on that. And if it doesn't work for you, okay, I'll buy you the coffee. And we'll regroup and try to figure out how to go back at it again. All right? We're going to close the service now. And uh, Kim, come on up. We're going to sing um, a song that talks about community. But after that, I really want to encourage us to do some community. The, the service is not over when we finish singing the song because I'm going to uh, turn you loose on each other to do those three Quaker questions that I talked about. What is your name? Where was the source of warmth in your home? And when did God become more than just a word to you? Okay, let's see.